Hello everybody, this is a response to a recently uploaded discussion between Paul Williams of Blogging Theology and Sabor Ahmed. They discuss points that have been refuted already many times, but also there are new areas of discussion that I will look into. Okay, well, what, is, what, what are some of the assumptions underlying uh, the understanding of the theory of evolution? Well, what's, what's implicit there in a worldview sense that might, might not be stated explicitly in the scientific narrative, do you think? There's many things. Um, firstly, take something very obvious that's, that's used all the time, which is um, a rival theory, a rival scientific theory like intelligent design. This is the first error. Intelligent design is not a scientific theory. It is pseudoscience as it is creationism packaged in a way to allow for the teaching of creationism in public schools in the United States. Its pseudoscientific credentials were examined in the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial in 2005, which concluded that intelligent design was not science. More specifically, it is untestable, unfalsifiable, and does not make predictions, so it is not subject to the scientific method and therefore not science. And it's not science because there's no scientist in the world who is publishing peer-reviewed papers on intelligent design. Intelligent design is not to our universities. It's not accepted as science. Therefore, intelligent design as a theory is uh, pseudoscience or it's invalid or it's not even, it's a non-starter. Well, the presupposition here, which is not being mentioned, is that of methodological naturalism because methodological naturalism states that Whenever we look at scientific phenomena, we are only going to refer to natural causes, natural effects, natural uh, processes. So from the outset, intelligent design, anything immaterial is ruled out. And that's how it should be in science, because anything immaterial or supernatural cannot be included in science as it cannot be reliably tested. There are no mechanisms for reliably testing the supernatural or including the supernatural in any experiment. If the supernatural interacts with the natural world, then those effects can be detected by science. This is the area shown as yellow in this diagram. However, although science could detect this effect, it is unable to attribute it to the supernatural until there is a mechanism to determine that it is supernatural. Until then, all science can say is that this effect is unexplained. But that's fine. But I think we move on then to what's called intelligent design theory. I mean, what, what is intelligent design? And, and should Muslims, uh, specifically Muslims, should, should we agree with this uh, idea, which seems to be particularly associated with uh, Christian um, thinkers in the United States? Uh, people like yeah. Stephen Meyer, of course, who's probably the most famous ID, intelligent design proponent in America. Um, is this something that Muslims, because a lot of Muslims seem very keen on this, is this something we should just follow and take advantage of, do you think? Yeah. I, these are very good questions. So I'll answer the first one, and yeah. then if I forget to answer the second one, you can remind me, Paul. So the first thing is, what is intelligent design theory? Intelligent design theory is the idea that there are certain features of biological organisms and the universe from which we can infer intelligent design. Now, that's all the theory says. It doesn't say anything about universal common ancestry because you have intelligent design proponents who accept universal common ancestry like Michael Behe and you have others like Paul Nelson who don't accept it. So right. it doesn't make a claim about genealogy. It doesn't say anything about phylogenetic reconstruction. That it's, it's neutral. It also doesn't say there is a God. This is what's important. Mm. Um, it's often described as a religious theory. It is not. All it's simply saying is there are certain features from which we can infer design. It doesn't mention God as the aim of intelligent design is to appear to be a scientific theory and not repackaged creationism, which it is. Here are the creation textbooks where you can see how creationism is replaced with the words intelligent design. A hilarious gaffe occurred when one of the books showed how creationists was replaced with design proponents in an incomplete manner, leading to the neologism see design proponentsists. This is the missing link between creationism and intelligent design. So there are a few components which I think are worth uh, discussing. Um, the first component is inference to the best explanation, which is something used historically. Uh, Maya um, on your channel, I'm sure he went into some detail about this. An inference of the best explanation leads to evolution when describing naturally occurring organisms. We have evidence of this. We have no evidence of design for biological organisms. We can infer design for man-made objects because we already know such objects are designed. We do not have this for biological organisms. 
For a thorough debunk of Stephen Meyer, please watch this video by Professor Dave Explains. There is the concept of irreducible uh, complexity and specified complexity. For a thorough debunk of these two terms, please watch this video from Professor Dave Explains on Michael Behe and irreducible complexity. So these three components together make up intelligent design theory. Intelligent design can actually be subscribed to even if you don't believe in God, even if you're agnostic. But its aim is to convince people that there is an intelligent designer and wonder who that is. Then the next step would be to introduce your God. Um, there's one intelligent design um, proponent, uh, David Belinsky, agnostic oh, yes. background. David Berlinski claims to be agnostic, but his articles and books are filled with religiously based creationist arguments. Intelligent design is a minimalistic idea. Now, the pushback against it is it's not science and there's no scientific evidence for it. And uh, it not being science, we covered before, it, it's, it's a circular argument because they deny it through methodological naturalism and then they say they can't do it. And if you understood science and the scientific method, then you will know why intelligent design is not part of science. Now, what's interesting is even though, like I said before, intelligent design is not allowed, right, um, mm -hmm. from, from, uh, uh, from a scientific perspective, what we find is that intelligence is being referred to when it suits uh, the mm -hmm. dominant, right? So Francis Crick. Having debunked many of Sabor's videos, I have come across what is commonly known in science as a Pratt. This is a point refuted a thousand times. He has the same script from which he repeats the same arguments again and again, to the point that it is incredibly tedious to debunk these points each time. One of this is his repetitive claim that Francis Crick and Richard Dawkins believed in panspermia. Rather than debunk this again, please watch my video called Support Ahmed is Clueless about panspermia. This, this, this insistence on a prejudice in favour of material explanations. But I mean, there's, there's much in life that is not material. I mean, our consciousnesses are not material, yeah. I, I would argue. The opinion that consciousness is immaterial and not a function of the brain is being countered by new evidence in neuroscience. Please watch my three videos on consciousness for a fuller explanation. What is the science to prove that only material reality is real? I'm, yeah. I'm asking a, a fundamental, I, I know this is a philosophical question, but I'm trying to frame it scientifically so it can fit in to this um, metaphysical naturalist worldview yeah. and, and so it can justify one of its premises. What is the scientific evidence for materialism is my question. Yeah, yeah. and I'll give you an answer, uh, which I've heard from Stephen Carroll, right, the physicist, oh, yeah. another new atheist, yeah. Yeah. and I want you to tell me <laughs> what you think about this answer. He says it works. He says when we... When, when we have scientific theories based upon naturalism, based upon methodological naturalism, rockets fly, people get well, medicine works. So that's the answer. Can we justify scientific method? Yes. Based um, on what he said. It works. It, it, it works. Um, planes fly, cars drive, mm. computers com that's, compute. It's an inductive argument. Um, <laughs> um, if, if, you, if you base medicine on, on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. Um, if you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. <laughs> But also, the, uh, and this is much more controversial, it's kind of my, my niche thing, but th there's a lot of peer-reviewed evidence now, empirically observed phenomena, where people um, have near-death experiences That's or right. had experiences right. uh, yeah. uh, under surgery, where people, um, uh, throughout any um, expectation this will happen, they find themselves, these are people who are clinically dead even, for a brief period, outside of their bodies, looking down from a vantage point on themselves as doctors and nurses and surgeons frantically try and revive this poor body on the slab in the hospital. Now, it's not just they observe it, that they, when they are resuscitated, because obviously they have been, so we know what happened, they're able to accurately report what they saw and heard happen to them. Now, this is physically impossible. This is an interesting topic. Near-death experiences are a type of out-of-body experience. We will look into the claims of blogging theology, but first watch Professor Susan Blackmore a professor of psychology, describe the type of people who have out-of-body experiences. 
An out-of-body experience is an experience in which you seem to perceive the world from a location outside your physical body. So according to this definition, if you've had that sense that you are looking down or you're up there or you're somewhere else and it feels absolutely real, you have had an out-of-body experience. Note the word experience. It's an experience of seeming to be out of the body. So here are just some very basic facts um, about OBEs. As I mentioned earlier, there have been lots and lots of surveys in lots of different countries um, and in different special groups. Um, but that roughly speaking, in the general population, it's pretty common. Eight to 20% have had it. And there are no differences in terms of sex, age, education, and all, all sorts of things of that kind. They just don't seem to matter at all. Um, there's some odd things about children. Very often adults claim they had OBEs as children, but children very rarely claim they have them. So there's something funny going on there. <clears throat> they mostly happen when people are lying down or sitting, quite often sitting in meditation, but definitely relaxing. But oddly enough, they mostly happen when people are lying on their back. And this becomes important later. Um, and of course, they happen close to death and on the edges of sleep and so on. The same people who have out-of-body experiences also have lucid dreams and sleep paralysis and are more likely to believe in the paranormal and they have what's called temporal lobe lability. That is, the temporal lobes here on either side of the brain um, are more unstable, more active, more responsive to, to different things, more changeable. Now, we know that when people have temporal lobe epilepsy and then they have serious random firing in the temporal lobes, they get mystical experiences, out-of-body experiences, deja vu, a whole lot of things like that. Um, but there's a range in normal people of how labile your temporal lobes are. If they're very, very stable, you're likely to be a quite steady sort of serious person and uh, not have weird experiences. And if you have high temporal lobe lability, it's, it's, more, it's more fluid. And, and there's a big range. So we can see how out-of-body experiences are predisposed to certain types of people. Here is an article which demonstrates how an out-of-body experience can be elicited repeatedly during stimulation of a part of the brain. I will link this article in the description. Looking at his other claims, he cites this paper. I have looked into this publication. It gives a few anecdotes of blind people supposedly seeing during the near-death experiences. There was only one case which was factually accurate where a blind man described the pattern on a tie. This later publication by the same authors describes how the blind do not see as we normally think of sight, but that they describe a kind of transcendental awareness that they call mind sight. I mean, I, this is not controversial, by the way. Everyone agrees, believe yeah. or unbelieve, it is physically impossible for these phenomena to be real. That's not true. Researchers accept the experience is real, but that most people studying in this area believe it is a function of the brain rather than a genuine spirit having the out-of-body experience. Now, why is this significant? Because there's tons of peer-reviewed academic research documenting this. There are plenty of examples of these out-of-body experiences, but there are very few cases where the person saw or heard something that they likely could not have known. Experiments have been done where numbers are put on shelves so the numbers cannot be seen from the floor but only from looking down from the ceiling. People having these out-of-body experiences have never been able to accurately recall any numbers they may have seen. These claims to have viewed um, oneself from outside of one's body have been checked and corroborated by third parties. Again, there are very few anecdotal cases. Only one case accurately described the situation in the operating room during their out-of-body experience. But what I find particularly interesting are those examples where people who have been born blind um, have near-death experiences. They have an out-of-body experience and they view, they see what's going on and accurately report what's going on. And then when they're resuscitated, they're still blind. Or people are born deaf and they're able to hear conversations uh, in their near-death experience which are corroborated and accurate. The, the reputable medical professionals will say, yes, I did say that. 
I could find no examples of anybody born deaf having a near-death experience where they hear people talking, which is independently verified. And these yeah. things are physically impossible in inverted commas. Now, there have been attempts to explain all this away so that the, the brain's last gasp of whatever. But I find them, I mean, I just find them completely unpersuasive. And they seem to be premised on the idea that our minds are somehow mere byproducts of our brain processes rather than yeah. independent, that our consciousness is independent of our physical brains. And at some points, it literally leads the physical brain um, in extremis. In summary, out of the many near-death experiences people have, a tiny number have information which can be verified as accurate, but it is not statistically significant from random guessing. We can recreate out-of-body experiences through stimulation of the brain. It is not conclusive evidence of a soul or a spirit, but those who are inclined to believe in a soul for spiritual or religious reasons seem to consider these experiences as evidence of such. I mean, I, I Google this. There, 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 some, some mainstream universities in America, University of Minnesota, I think, there are peer-reviewed academic papers published on their official website by professors of psychology and so on that discuss the nature of people who are born blind and deaf, having near-death experiences and observing themselves outside their own bodies accurately. And they evaluate the long academic session looking at all the pros and cons. It comes to the conclusion that these experiences are real. They're objective. Yeah. They're not yeah. hallucinations of the mind. And that's the yeah. conclusion they reach. I think he means the University of Virginia, as I could not find anything from the University of Minnesota. The University of Virginia has an active research department for near-death experiences, but the website does not contain the articles that Blogging Theology says about objective, verifiable accounts of near-death experiences. They state the experiences are real, but don't say anything about a mechanism independent of brain function. Um. Also, we have to keep in mind that theologically, uh, Muslims and Christians have always made arguments for God. And the design argument has been one of the best arguments um, that's been used. And using design has been denied because of, you know, the Darwinian claims on biology. So mm -hmm. intelligent design will give us the ability to use, um, uh, you know, biology to make arguments for the divine. Now, there is obviously a gap because in intelligent design can only refer to an in, you know intelligent cause. And we have to, you know... Uh, shorten that gap and explain why we believe this is actually God. The rest of this video is general discussion. Thank you for watching and please let me know what you think in the comment section.